Chapter V. A Renewal of Covenants. When the saints reached the Great Salt Lake Valley, a new life seemed to open up for the Mormons. The land and its seclusion presented grand hopes and rich prospects for the future. Here they were free from the reach of mobs, injustices, and tyrants. They acquired new fares, new communities and new freedoms. These conditions offered them another chance to live their religion unmolested. However, in taming the desert, building settlements, and defending themselves from the Indians, they would of necessity depend on each other more than ever before. Failures, weakness, or apostasy could spell out disaster to their very existence. Under such circumstances, they wanted to start afresh once more. On this day the twelve were re-baptized. Why? Because the church, having broken old ties in the East was, in a way, experiencing a new birth. Because, owing to conditions of life on the plains, regular church routine could not always be observed. For this reason for non-observance of certain regulations were made by the people and accepted by the leaders. But now those who stood at the head of the church wanted a gesture of support to themselves, and a sign that willing obedience would be given to the rules of the church. This was affected by re-baptism. Wilford Woodruff Journal, August 6, 1847. The principle of re-baptism was again becoming a popular practice in the history of the Mormon people. The purpose of re-baptism, as before mentioned, was not just for the individuals who had lost their records. Although many records were lost, the purpose of re-baptism at this time was for a renewal of covenants and remission of sins. Re-baptism began with the first presidency of the church and the quorum of twelve apostles. From this re-baptism of the church leaders, it proceeded throughout the rest of the church. President Young must have taken quite seriously such irregularities of the camp of the pioneers as we have already noted in a former chapter, for he now proposed to them a solemn renewal of their covenants to righteousness, a new avowal of their acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ by baptism, President Young himself to set the example. This was first proposed to the twelve and their immediate associates, then to the camp. CHC 2 287. Bancroft's history of Utah gives the number of satins in the valleys at this time at 400. On the 8th of August he records the re-baptisms to be almost that number. The battalion brethren moved their wagons and formed a corral between the forks of City Creek. Brym exhorted the brethren to be re-baptized, himself setting the example and reconfirming the elders. On the 8th of August 300 were immersed, the service is commencing at 6 o'clock in the morning. History of Utah, 1840-86, Bancroft, page 265. The historian Bancroft accounted for nearly everyone of an eligible age that was re-baptized. This is an evidence that the rule for re-baptism was established for everyone who was to come into the valley. These first pioneers set the example for all others to follow. Friday, August 6, 1847, the apostles in G.S.L. Valley renewed their covenants by baptism, and the rest of the company soon after followed their example. Church Chronology, Andrew Jensen, page 34. The authorities decided that all that came to the valleys should renew their covenants by baptism. So all the Bushman family were re-baptized, and the saints did enjoy rest from their enemies for ten years. John Bushman Diary, MSS 1935, page 11. The re-baptism program continued with every immigrant, regardless of their position or office in the church. An evidence of this procedure is the testimonial of Apostles Parley Pratt and John Taylor, who entered the valley four months after the first group of settlers. Having repented of our sins and renewed our covenants, President John Taylor and myself administered the ordinances of baptism. These solemnities took place with us and most of our families, November 28, 1847. Autobiography of P. P. Pratt, page 360. Rebaptism was recognized as a requirement, and there were also manifestations of divine approval. After the arrival of the several divisions of the company that left winter quarters in June, they were called upon to repent and renew their covenants in baptism, elders Taylor and Pratt setting the example. The saints very generally responded to this requirement, and the Spirit of God rested upon them in great power. Life of John Taylor, by Roberts, page 193. Others have mentioned the requirement of re-baptism for all who came into the valleys. It became an accepted rule for the immigrants. After the arrival of the pioneers in the Salt Lake Valley, and subsequently for a considerable period, all those who entered the valley were baptized anew at the request of President Brian Young, who, with the Council of the Twelve, set the example to the people who were gathering from all parts of the world. Doc. Of Sal.
2 333. They teach re-baptism here in Utah as a doctrine. Temple Lot Case, page 341, Joseph C. Kingsbury, right bracket, Wilford Woodruff relates a humorous incident that occurred during these days of re-baptisms. In questioning one young man, he said, In all the trials incident to the pilgrimage and pioneer life, have you ever sworn nor used bad language? No, sir, was the prompt reply. Have you never broke the Sabbath day? No, sir, came the quick response. Have you never cheated your neighbor in trade? No, sir, thundered the unrepentant man. Then, for heaven's sake, go off and do something. You are the only perfect man I ever saw, and hope never to see another in this life. Life of Wilford Woodruff, page 373. The practice of re-baptism, upon entering the Great Salt Lake Valley, was taught for many years. Eighteen years after the first re-baptisms in the valley, it was still being taught. In 1865 Apostle Orson Pratt said, That seems to be a kind of standing ordinance for all Latter-day Saints who emigrate here, from the First Presidency down. All are re-baptized and set out anew by renewing their covenants. Orson Pratt J.D. 18 160. Thomas B. Marsh came back into the church in 1857 and was re-baptized while on his journey to the Salt Lake Valley. However, when he arrived in the valley, he was requested to be re-baptized again. When he came to Florence, he applied to Brother Cunningham, who was then present dashing there, for baptism. Brother Cunningham at first refused to baptize him, probably thinking that it would be better for him to wait till he came to this place, but he afterwards gave his consent to Brother Marsh's being baptized. Brother Marsh now wishes to be received into full fellowship, and to be again baptized here. B. Young J.D., page 209. Rebaptism were not confined to the Salt Lake Valley. Oliver B. Huntington, who served as a missionary in England during the year of 1847, was also administering this ordinance in that country. Sunday 21, 1847. In the afternoon I preached to the saints upon such as I thought best touched their present case. I omitted evening meeting there and all repaired to the water for baptism and re-baptism. I re-baptized six. We then repaired to the house of W.M. Stuart and I confirmed them. O.B. Huntington Diary, page 117. In another entry, by Elder Huntington, he gives some evidence that re-baptism was being practiced in England months, perhaps even years, before the saints ever entered the Salt Lake Valley. The saints were more lively there than I could have expected, they being visited very seldom by any of the elders. They were ready, many, for re-baptism, but I could not attend to it then, and thought it best to let them consider upon it, and the more get ready to go at once. Now it was almost a general thing through England right bracket that the saints were being re-baptized, for they had many and mostly become old and cold, and it required a renewal of covenants and fresh works, together with mere faith and diligence, to give the work new impetus, and revive the dropping spirits of the saints, and the work generally. Huntington Diary, February 7, 1847, page 114. This little-known principle of re-baptism was much more popular in the early days of the church than has been generally recognized. Its history played a great part in the church for many years before the Salt Lake Valley was settled. This principle was believed and practiced for a number of reasons, but the foremost reason for re-baptism was to renew covenants, have sins remitted, and to start afresh in serving God and obeying the laws of his gospel. Picture. Pond in Kaysville. In 1856, by the direction of Brian Young, all of the saints were required to begin a reformation which was inaugurated with everyone being baptized again. Right bracket.